Some of you see me laughing because uh, there's a joke about me talking in time. They don't mix well oil and water. So I'll dive right in. I'm Brandon Smith, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a little bit about how God moved in my life and is moving in others just like he wants to move in your guys' life. So we'll go straight to this picture. I had just got back from Haiti, and um, so I'll give you a little background story. We're up in, in the mountains outside of Plaisance, which is basically... Um, a very uncomfortable truck ride uh, for hours upon hours up into these hills. So here we are, and we're building the foundation of a church, and they're doing a lot of different things. So this boy in the black over here on, on my left arm, I call him the horse handler, and you'll know why here in a second. Uh, he runs things from the market, puts them on his, his mule and his horse, and he goes up into this mountain town and provides. Well, anyhow, this kid... Uh, rides down on his horse. These kids are worshiping in the street right here where you see the people gathered in the back. They have drums and all this stuff, and they're worshiping, and they're saying, Holy Spirit, come. We want to encounter you. And he rides right through him. He gets thrown off his horse. He busts his knee up. It's dislocated and disfigured. My friend Mike Clagg, he says, Brandon, hey, you got to come check this kid out. All these kids are pulling on his leg. So I go. I'm going to check it out. As I'm walking over, I see his knee, and that's not really... Uh, the main attraction, because the Lord puts on my heart, uh, pray for this kid that he's known and he's seen and he's not shamed. And I'm like, yeah, sure, thanks, I'll do that. Um, so I'm praying for his knee, and this stirring in my heart just gets bigger and bigger. His knee gets set, but I put my hand on his chest and pray for the Father's heart to encounter him, that he's seen, that he's loved, and that that this this moment that the enemy tried to position him in as a disadvantage, he actually was blessed in that point in time where the village and all the kids were laughing and teasing this kid. God met him where he was at and encountered his heart. So I have a stirring. I go back and I'm journaling this, this um, whole experience after I hear the backstory that this kid is actually an angry kid, a kid that's been kicked out of church, a kid that gets in fight, gets in trouble, all these things very similar to, to my youth about this age. And uh, he's throwing rocks at the church. So I'm like, whoa, God, this is, that was way big. You are so big. Thank you for that. I want another encounter. And so I start praying for this kid three, four pages later in my journal all about this kid and seeing him for another opportunity to be intentional about setting this kid free of the bondage that he's experienced, the shame and the guilt and everything that comes along with rejection uh, that God wanted to encounter him. So I'm going to set up this next story, that kid with the most infectious, amazing, beautiful smile. He has the father's heart. He loves, loves people, and he loves people to love on him, which in the Haitian culture is not it. The elders don't love on the kids. The, the, they don't love on each other as males. And so I'm just loving on this kid all week. We go to the marketplace. He gets kicked out. Well, he gets kicked out because he's the son of a voodoo priest. And there's a curse in, in this, this bondage that gets handed down generationally from, from grandparents, fathers, sons, all that. You guys have heard things like that. That is real. This kid, tell me that smile right there. Is, is a kid that's possessed, possessed by the Holy Spirit, <laughs> that smile that brings joy to everybody and sets people free. His joy is infectious. So this is a picture. He gets booted out of the marketplace that morning and is there with a shovel. This kid, dislocated knee, encounters the Holy Spirit, the father's heart. He has a shovel. They're both putting dirt into the wheelbarrow that morning to help build the foundation of a church. And so I say that with, with this message that I wanted to share with you guys that, that there's a misconception about the foundation of the church and that it's perfect. It's actually built on broken people like you and I. So I'm going to share a little bit about my brokenness and I'm going to speed through it because I really feel like the Lord's stirring my heart to impart that love to you guys and that joy and restore those places of brokenness especially in family. So I wanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap through this, but this is my authentic freedom story, okay? And, and it set me free of vices. And when I say that, this is, that the Lord has encountered me in, in specific points and times in my life where I felt shamed, alone, and the enemy isolated me uh, beyond belief. And so here I am, my family, blue-collar family. My dad 
works multiple jobs. My mom works multiple jobs. It's me and my older brothers. Um, so that's, that's where uh, it kind of starts. And, and my family doesn't know how to show love in an appropriate manner. Therefore, we don't know how to receive love. And so as a kid, you see that example, and that's what you have to work on. That's not the best platform, and I think we have a lot of that in this room um, based on what the Lord was telling me during worship and some different things. So 10 years old, I experienced um, the introduction to drugs, and it came in the manner of do this or else. Well, everybody who's been in that hostile environment knows what or else is. I'll pass. And so at that point in time, that starts this journey. 12 years old, introduced to alcohol. And continued this kind of rebellious attitude that, uh, well, this is the life that's for me, whatever. I have this rebellious attitude. I don't care about you. They don't really care about me. But, you know, let's go for it anyways and let's see how much chaos we can create and, uh, and destroy, you know, everything that's built. Because it felt good. There was this artificial fullness about it. And it was definitely artificial, like Brandon talked about earlier. We know truth, we know lies, and we know artificial and fake, and we know the real story and what truth is. So 14 years old, um, I'm in high school. I'm an athlete and a pretty good one, um, and that's kind of the path that I've chosen for baseball. I um, continue to party. I'm partying at school. It's really not slowing down. I don't see it really affecting my, my, my game at all or my talent. My talent overrides that well. Going into the summer, um, I, I had a back injury throughout the year, and I had been taking pain pills to get me through basketball season and baseball season, basically taking handfuls of Vicodins and, and different um, narcotics and, and, and things of that nature just to play, just to be on the field. No one knows it was a secret. Well, I find out that uh, my L5 disc is broken, and uh, my tolerance for pain and my tolerance for medication was through the roof. So at that point in time, we were fighting we were uh, with, with a different group of people um, in, in our town, and uh, I have back surgery. This is where God intervenes. He puts me on my back, slows me down, and removes me, physically removes me from the environment that I had been putting myself in, causing trouble. And guess what? When you, when you cause chaos and you cause a wake, there's a point in time where that thing catches up to you and all the debris washes up on shore and you have to deal with it, okay? And so I remember it caught up to everybody but me. Everybody that I was running with got uh, time in juvenile detention, got probation, house arrest. Some tried as adults and did actual sufficient jail time. Others got more wrapped up into addiction and some of these gateway things that led them to more bondage, more destruction. Well, I found out from afar, I was like, hey, I I'm good on like that extreme and I'm going to continue pursuing. So as I pursue my athletic prowess, I still am like, ah, I won't do those things. And I make agreements that I'll just do some of these things. And um, so I'm like, I'm, I'm better than that, but I'm going to still do this. And um, so at that point in time, I'm 20 years old. I become a father. I kind of abandon. And as I've had years of stuffing down emotion and things of what a father looks like and what love looks like and all these other false ideas of reality, I started operating on, on my will and the things that I wanted for my life and that I felt like this is what, what I'm being called to do. And I'm going to be a professional athlete because I've worked all my life for that. That's totally the plan. Mm. Not so much. I'm 21 years old. I, I'm having probably one of the best statistical years of my, my career. And um, God interrupts and intervenes again. And I have a blood clot in my shoulder. And um, my arm swells up about three times the size that it is. And uh, I continue to play because I think I have like a muscle tear. So come to find out, I have a blood clot. I go into this surgery. It's supposed to be a two, basically two to three day. You're in, you're out. They make sure that you don't bleed and, and you're good. So basically two days post-op, I'm sitting there and I'm joking and my coaches are there and I'm like, hey, you guys better have my ticket for New York. I'm going to St. John's. I'm going to play. And you know what I mean? I'm just kind of joking around. I have a very charismatic attitude. They're like, yeah, right, bro. And so I'm like, okay, cool. Well, what happens I bleed out three liters of fluid in my lungs. I'm drowning. 
Any of you know in the medical profession, doctors, surgeons, they don't work on the weekends. Mine just happened to be in there. I don't know what he left. I don't know why he was there. Um, I, I fully believe now that God put him there in that place to put the chest tube in my chest and, and, and bring me back at that particular point. So he's moving in my life, but I say this because there's a guy, instrumental person in my life, a, a mighty man of God that uh, had called me, and he's, he speaks over all the athletic departments. His name's uh, David Lane, and he, he's in Tampa, and I love him to death, and he is, he is a mighty man of God. Well, God put on his heart at about, I don't know, 5 o'clock a.m. when I'm sitting in ICU, ready to give up, done with all the surgeries, done with the blood transfusions, done with the pain, done with all this. I'm over, overwhelmed with anger and all these things that they can't get it right. The surgeon can't do their job. Blame, 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 blame. Well, he comes in and he says, and this is a voicemail because I don't have service, so praise God that that message came across when it did. It says, God has a plan for your life, even if you don't understand it now. He's seen it play out. He's already seen it play out, each and every one of you. He has a plan. He has a will. He has a call for your life. (laughs) And he's seen it play out. So faith and trust is something that needs to be restored. And so this is the first time I really feel the Father's love, the Father's heart come upon me, tears, snot, the whole shebang, and I'm like, wow, that's awesome. But the backside of that story is I soon forget that experience because I couldn't tangibly place what I felt with what it really was. And so... I speed along, I'm done, my identity's over as a baseball player, I try to go find another identity as a firefighter and a paramedic. I go through extensive training, I'm very good, I'm gonna get hired, not too many people are hiring in the industry because of of budget cuts, actually people are getting laid off, so I'm like, great choice. Um, So at that point in time, you know, I'm doing shift work and on my days off, I I still like to um, drink a lot. And uh, that is my choice. I don't do drugs. I, don't do, I put that chapter behind me. But alcohol is legal, and I love t- to drink. And I love to drink a lot. And I love people that love to drink a lot and have a good time. And so 25 years old, Easter Sunday, no coincidence. I'm with family. We have a little turmoil in the family. We don't know how to express our emotions without anger and yelling at each other and getting physical. There's alcohol. It's fueled environment. So I separate the environment, take one brother away from the other. We go out and continue to party uh, in the streets of Sacramento. I get a DUI. Again, anger, guilt, shame towards my brother. Um, You know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have this. I'd have my job. I wouldn't have to go tell these people that are about to hire me in a week that I can't get hired because I'm not going to have a license, that I made a stupid decision. I had to own that. I actually did that. I drove over 100 miles, sat in front of a guy who was putting his name on me to hire me, and I had to have a nice big slice of humble pie and deal with, with the consequences. So as I go through this identity shift, God stirs in me what the vices that, that have taken over and oppressed me and held me down for so long. And it's, it's time to give up that last one, alcohol. And so this point, I'm like, I'm done. I'm not going to do that anymore. I had, I had built up an anger towards alcohol because it had robbed me of everything that I had worked for. I had sacrificed the things that I felt like were the call on my life to go help people and, and help the injured, help the sick, help all these people, and, and essentially set them free. What, what God has done in my life, he, he always in my journey is I've been empty, and I've been searching for something more. Well, I had, I had had a little moment of like, you know, first time prayer of whatnot that I can recall. And it was something along these lines of, God, if there's somebody else that lives this life, show them to me. Because I didn't know them. My sphere was partiers, gamblers, chaos creators. That was it. That's all I knew. I didn't know the other side. I didn't even know it existed. In comes my wife. And she had been living this way. 
and I sit there and I talk to her, and like many of you have experienced, when people come to you broken, they, they end up sharing their life story with you. You didn't ask them to. It just happens. You're safe. You're a trusted person. You have the presence of God on you. And so that's what happened. I sat there and I just verbally vomited my entire baggage and my life story on her lap. Not that she asked to hear it, but she did and she got it. And, um, you know, I, I'm blessed to have her because, you know, she is, she is a mighty woman of God. And so we start going to church. We, we are spending time in meditation and prayer. And God has always spoke to me through imagery, through dreams, through um, highlighting certain people. I'm an I'm a observer. I'm a watcher. Um, so don't be, um, don't be freaked out if I'm, like, staring at you during worship. There's probably a reason. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm going to tell you about the section of Enter the Rock, and this is, this is my home, and, uh, and you are my brothers and sisters and, and family, so I'm going to share this with you. We walk in. We don't know why. Pastor Francis is out there, and man, he has the Father's heart, and he just melts me with this big old fatherly hug. And I'm like, awesome. I don't know who that was, but that hug guy is like, pay that man. So I walk in with Jess and, and, my, uh, and our son, Case, and he's about eight months years old. And as all you parents know, when you go into a new environment, a new place, and you're trying to have this experience, you're just praying like, man, God, just, just let them go in and not have a complete meltdown. Case yeah. kicks off his shoes, puts them away, basically jumps over the barrier they have, and he starts playing. We look at each other in awe, and we're like, okay, wow. Big obstacle checked off. We walk in, Tracy Lundquist leading worship, setting the atmosphere in here. It's palpable. The Holy Spirit is just moving in this place. I can't identify it. I don't call what the Holy Spirit is, but I come in. It's thick, and the presence there, and my heart's stirring, and I'm, like, getting emotional, and these things are coming up in me, and I'm like, I don't know what it is, but, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Snot, tears, all these things, all this healing, all these things coming down, and, and just a freshness of love is pouring out. Then comes in Bob and, and Bob Hasty, Pastor Bob, uh, amazing man, authentic. Uh, I, I love his, uh, his filter or lack thereof because he, <laughs> he speaks to the broken people because he gets it. I get it. A lot of us get it. We need to hear an authentic message of how broken you were, how broken you are. And how God comes and intervenes and sets you free and heals you of those broken places. So as that goes, uh, fast forward, Brandon mentioned, you know, we have an anniversary coming up. So we'll take, uh, I don't know, basketball tickets or something. He wants to take me out on a date. But um, <laughs> I dive into discipleship, community, and, and mission and what I found is that all the relationships that I've had and built, and you're talking locker rooms full of 40, 50 guys where I was a leader, I was a captain, these relationships were built on, on very, very uh, loose uh, foundation. And when I was introduced to discipleship and community, real community, based on, on the foundation of this right here, like Brandon mentioned, there's nothing like it. Guys that I thought, like, how I could never relate to somebody in church. They don't know me. They've never experienced what I've experienced. They haven't been through the abuse, the trauma, the addictions. Yeah, right. Well, come to find out, good friend Sean Patterson says, and he, I told him today, thank you so much for sharing that because it stuck with me. When you build relationships on a firm foundation, doesn't matter your differences, a firm foundation of the Father's heart, the Father's love, it cannot be moved, it cannot be destroyed, and it cannot be shaken by the enemy. So as I learn about all these things and setting people free, and, and, and Joanne Moody shares her story, and she's another powerhouse and authentic human being that, that her filter is, is also a, a love of mine and uh, shares authentically of how God moves, we start seeing people being set free, healed, radically healed, radically experienced, inner healing happens. In Haiti alone, I know there's some people that went on the mission with me. We watched a lady who has um, had a stroke, and she stood up under her own power. God, the presence of God, washed down on her, and she stood up in front of about 60 people in that village. Do you think the ripple effect of that um, has a lasting effect? Absolutely. 
So what I want to just share with you guys is do not underestimate the power of your testimony. Do not underestimate the call on your life that God's given you. You may think you're normal like me, and I am, but I'm relatable, <laughs> and I've been through what you, you've been through. I'm going through what you're going through. I understand it. I understand the, the hurt, the shame, the pain, the rejection. The enemy wanting to isolate you because you're like, oh, I can't talk about that. That's a little bit too sensitive, right? Church, we get in church and we're supposed to be perfect. Oh, don't, don't stand up there and say you got problems with your marriage because you're going to be less than. No, I have challenges in my marriage. I have challenges as a father. I have challenges in the workplace. I have challenges with friends. We're no different. So I'm going to read you a passage that came to me um, and, and hopefully it'll, it'll speak to you and give you encouragement. First Peter 6 through 9. Stand firm against him, the devil. Be strong in faith. Remember your family of believers all over the world are going through the same exact struggles. If that's not encouragement to you guys that we go through struggles from when this was, was put in context to now, that struggles are real, that there's an enemy out there that wants to, to rob you of the will of God and wants to deter you from the real call and the real purpose on your life. Don't ignore that, but know that our God is so much bigger than that, that the community that he's put us in is so much stronger than that. The faith of this community, even when you have lack of faith, lean on somebody else for their faith, tap into their resources and how they've been set free. So, this came up to me, and I'm going to share it because there's no one coming in behind us. Remember, we are the people that we pray for. I'm broken. I've been broken. I've been restored. I've been redeemed. And God wants to restore, redeem, and speak life into your guys' family relationships, into your marriages, into your kids. Don't underestimate the ripple effect of when God throws a pebble into your pond and how far that ripple effect can be and wash over. I had a conversation with a friend of mine. He's like, man, I, I don't want to, I, I don't know that I'm the person. Don't underestimate. You are the person. You might be the answer to that person's prayers at that particular point in time.